We're going to go ahead and look at a 2003 Jeep Liberty with a 3.7 liter. We're going to look at some known good running compression waveforms today. The tool we'll be using in conjunction with our Pico scope is the Pico WPS 500 pressure transducer. This pressure transducer takes pressure and changes it into a voltage signal that our scope can read. We're going to install this just like we would a compression tester. We're going to remove the spark plug, put a compression hose in, install our transducer, and hook it up via the BNC cable to the PicoScope itself. After, of course, we tell the Pico software that our channel A, which is in blue, is a WPS 500 in the range A, which we'll get further into the different ranges as we progress in this class, we find that we get a running compression pattern. In red I have an ignition sink, which is just a uh, trigger for the ignition coil itself. Now this is a running compression waveform, so we're at about 61 PSI. Now that seems low if you're used to doing a cranking compression test, but generally speaking, a real generic rule of thumb is that your running compression is going to be about half of your cranking compression. So. If we were to do a cranking compression test on this, we'd probably find that we get about 120 PSI. I'm going to zoom in for more detail on just the in-cylinder pressure. So what we're actually seeing here is the four strokes of the internal combustion engine. Up here is your top dead center, and here is top dead center again. So from these two points, in between is 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. Starting right here at TDC, and going down, this is what we're going to call an expansion stroke. Normally this is where the power stroke would be, but technically since there's not a spark plug in there, it's going to be just simply an expansion stroke. If we were to actually have a pressure transducer in the cylinder during an actual power stroke, things would look just a little bit different. blue line here represents zero PSI. So everything underneath this line right here is actually vacuum. So on the expansion stroke, we're going to pull a little bit of vacuum, and right here is about the peak point where we stop pulling vacuum. After that, we actually equalize pressure, and we end up having atmospheric pressure. So what happened right here at this point is that the exhaust valve opened. These little pulses you're seeing here, that's just normal turbulence of all that air trying to escape past the exhaust valve. What happened right here is your intake valve opened, and the piston is beginning to pull a vacuum on the system and we're going to maintain that vacuum. At this point right here we begin to create positive pressure again so what happened right here is your intake valve closed, both valves are now closed and the pistons on its way up towards top dead center and this is your compression stroke and then you're building your peak compression. So the question is why do we use this information? Well uh, things that we're analyzing with this waveform is internal cylinder issues so if we had some valve issues, we could see it with this waveform. We're also going to use this for our class to analyze where TDC is. If I know exactly where TDC is, I can compare it to my cam crank sensor to determine if I have possibly a cam or crank timing issue, like, for instance, a jumped timing chain, which has become very common on modern vehicles. Now I could do a little bit of a further analysis on this. I'm using the cursors within the Pico software. From this point to this point, I am looking at the delta time in milliseconds, which I have 202.9 milliseconds. This point to this point, I'm looking at the delta pressure, the difference of pressure. I can also see my peak pressure, which is at 60.8 psi. So if instead of guesstimating based off the chart on the left, I'm actually going to look at the actual peak pressure. In this waveform I'm looking for how long it took before top dead center for the spark plug to be fired. And now I'm going to go to all data. Inside all data sometimes we can find these specs where it's actual valve opening specs. So if, for instance the intake valve opens 3.6 degrees after top dead center. It then closes 247.1 degrees after top dead center. Now what I can do is use this software with this camshaft timing calculations to type in the specs over here and then I will create 
I will press the calculate button and create a chart over here that will tell me exactly how many degrees after top dead center in the 720 degree cycle exhaust valve opening happened, exhaust valve closing, intake valve opening, intake valve closing. It will also more importantly tell me how many times in milliseconds into my scope capture this happened. Using this information I can identify with some tags exactly when the exhaust valve is supposed to open, the exhaust valve is supposed to close, the intake valve opening and the exhaust intake valve closing. Using this information I can look at where the exhaust valve was supposed to open and where it actually did open. In this case it did open exactly where it was supposed to. So again one more way to rule out a camera crank timing issue. Another view I have of what we call an overlay will label 180 degree sections of the 720 degree crankshaft cycle. It's just one more way of breaking up all this information. Now putting it to use for cam and crank signals we're going to switch vehicles to a 2004 Tahoe with a 5.3 liter. In this capture you'll see I have my top dead center. Top dead center I got 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. In this class the more we learn about cam and crank sensors you'll understand that we're going to try to compare TDC to unique cam and crank signatures. In this case this GM is a very easy one to understand because right at this point in the signal is where TDC is supposed to be. So it's really easy to determine that the cam timing is good on this vehicle. Sure, this is because we're comparing it to the actual pressures inside the cylinder.